It is my pleasure now to introduce the final speaker of the symposium, uh, Dr. James McLaurin of the University of Otago in New Zealand. Uh, Dr. McLaurin is pr primarily a philosopher of biology. He has written on innateness, fitness, theoretical morphology, bio biological diversity, universal Dar Darwinism, and on the application of, e of evolutionary principles in other domains such as philosophy of time and economics. He has also written on philosophical method. He is the co-author with uh, Kim Steren Sterenly, Steren Sterenly. Uh, What is Biodiversity? Um, co-editor with uh, Greg Dawes, who is a colleague of mine actually, uh, A New Science of Religion, with, uh, they came out with Rutledge in uh, 2012. Uh, Dr. McLaurin uh, re completed his PhD at the Australian National University and he's been the head of the Department of Philosophy at the University of Otago since 2009. Today uh, he will speak on the subject, When in Doubt, Biodiversity Measurement and the Cost of Extinction. Hello, everybody. Uh, I want to start by thanking uh, our organizers. I know everybody has, but we all should constantly. They've been amazing, uh, Brett and Gillian and Tannis and everybody who's worked on uh, the last three days. Uh, and I'd particularly like them to, to thank them for uh, persuading me to come such a long distance. It's been worth it. I've loved it. Uh, OK. Um, and of course, I'd like to thank you. We're at the last session on the last day, and you made it through, and you hung on in there. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, Tom, came, where's Tom? Tom came up to me this morning and said, um, so last session, you're going to close it out? You're going to bring it home, he said. Um, so I'm not sure if I'm going to close it out or bring it home. I'm very aware of the fact that I am what stands between you and the Santa Parade. <laughs> uh, or, or perhaps the conference party. Uh, I take that responsibility seriously, so we'll get on to it. Uh, so, when in doubt, biodiversity measurement and the cost of extinction. Uh, let me start out and say the cost uh, of extinction, cost and extinction, this is where you will see those words and you won't see them again in this paper because I'm going to be talking about um, the value of living systems, which of course is the cost of extinction, but so I'm going to do the talk that way around and think about what it is that um, we value in uh, living systems. So this talk is about using biodiversity to estimate that value. Uh, yesterday, Ted gave us a talk, a uh, fascinating talk, about biodiversity and about issues that have been raised recently about biodiversity. And Ted and I talked after his talk, uh, and I thought that was great fun. And I think, um, actually, what it persuaded me is that these issues are just, you know, they are much more important. They're, they should be more central in our thinking. We should address them. So I thought I would start with some of those issues. So I picked two. Uh, which particularly resonate for me, so I'm just going to list them. And then I'm going to give you my take on those issues really through the course of this talk. And I don't know if that's going to satisfy Ted. Uh, most of the days of the week it satisfies me. Okay, so we'll, we'll see how we go. So, so I, and I'm sorry this is sort of transliteration. This is how I think of these, but, uh, but I think these are, are the issues that you've raised. So firstly, the term biodiversity is ambiguous. So biodiversity is in quotes there just because I'm talking about the word. They're not, it's not scare quotes or anything. So the word itself is ambiguous in the sense that we mean different things by it at different times. A little more technically, it refers to different things at different times. So sometimes, particularly in legislation um, and regulation, we talk about biodiversity in the UN Convention sense. All differences at all levels. And that is a tremendously broad definition, and it's so broad as to seem almost empty, and in particular, not to seem particularly helpful. 
So lots of you work on very practical projects in conservation, and if as you're going out the door in the morning, I shout out to you, hey, don't forget all the differences at all the levels, that doesn't seem to be helping you very much. How do we operationalize that? How do we turn that into something that's useful? So sometimes we, we write about and talk about biodiversity in this tremendously broad way. When we do the science, we tend to be interested in aspects of biodiversity. And it depends what sort of science we're doing. So, so in the book, uh, What is Biodiversity? Kim and I go through lots of different types of science Projects. So if you're interested in developmental biology, uh, you might be interested in morphological diversity or genetic diversity. If you're interested in ecology, you'd be interested in functional diversity. You know, maybe morphology, obviously genetics will come into it, but it depends what sort of science you're interested in. If you're doing evolutionary theory, the sort of differences you care about will be different again. So it looks like we've got, you know, and we call all this stuff biodiversity, you know, it's all the differences at all the levels. But it just looks like we have a lot of leeway in the way that we use the term. And if legislation says what you've got to do is conserve biodiversity, then it looks like we can do quite a lot of things under that rubric. And is that an issue? Is that a problem? So uh, Kim and I firmly believe that it, it's not a problem in the sense that um, there's a fact of the matter about the sort of differences that matter in different scientific contexts. So we think so long as you can, for each context you're working in, work out the sort of differences, and there might be lots of types of differences that matter in that context, then biodiversity is doing just fine. But of course the issue for us is that, you know, we're interested in conservation biology. That's obviously the initial context for biodiversity, but it's certainly not the only one now. We use it in all over the place in science. So in conservation biology, can we work out from that context what we want biodiversity to mean here, such that it does some work for us, such that it helps us to engage in conservation? Let's say we can. Uh, I, I'm going to try and sell you on the idea that we can, but just for now, let's say that we can. And then Ted's point is, so why? Why on earth do we want to do this? I mean, what we're doing is we're saying that the most important thing here, the thing that we have to fundamentally conserve about the natural world is the differences between things. And, and when you put it that way, it just sounds odd. You know, the most important thing in this room is the distances between people. It just, you know, when we think about conservation, we think about the entities and the processes. And if you ask people about, you know, why they love nature, we've all been talking about, you don't conserve it unless you love it. What do you love? Do you love distances between things? Because I don't love distances between things. This seems like an odd thing to think. So that's the, that's the sort of second worry. And in particular, it's a worry if you think that biodiversity is the bottom level. It's fundamental. It's the thing that we're supposed to be conserving. There's lots of ways that we do it, but it's, it's the basic level. Well, why is it the basic level? So that's the worry that I will give you my take on. So the first thing to say is I don't think that biodiversity is fundamental to conservation in the sense that conservation is always motivated by it. Conservation for all sorts of different reasons, and sometimes diversity is important, sometimes it isn't. We do conservation uh, trying to maintain ecosystem services, we do it for a host of psychological reasons, for socio-cultural reasons, for economic reasons. Sometimes diversity is important, always important. So I don't think that biodiversity is fundamental in that sense. But I do think that there's a sense in which we use biodiversity in conservation that really is special, that really is different from everything else we do. And so that's what I'm going to try and talk about in this talk. OK, let's try and make good on that. So I agree that it's odd to think about the value of the natural world as being located in the distances between species or the differences between species in their diversity rather than in the feet of the species themselves, the features of the ecosystems or the communities that we care about, that we love and hence want to conserve. Let's just forget about conservation for a bit. Forget everything you know. 
right? Just, just given what I've just said, where, don't look at the screen, forget everything you know, all right? Well, what should we do? So we want to conserve nature. We want to conserve the environment. Do we? How do we know that we do? What's valuable about nature? We should go and talk to everybody. We should poll the scientists, but we should poll everybody and say, what is it about the natural world that's valuable? What do you love? So what would they say? And we can look back at the screen. I'm thinking that we would get a, a long list of descriptions. Species or ecosystems are beautiful, exciting, useful, economically useful, ecologically, scientifically important, tied to culture, all sorts of ways. People would mention all sorts of things. Some people are slightly more minded might mention intrinsic value. Some people will mention spiritual value. People will say all sorts of things here. Now, we've acknowledged this quite a bit over the last few days, and um, in a number of science talks, people have stood up and said there are different ways in which we value biodiversity, and these ones we can put numbers on. They're the objective ones, and there are some other ones. And that's true. That's all true. Well, maybe we can put numbers on some of the social ones, but it's tougher. I can put numbers on the value of my car. I can't put enough numbers on the value of my car, sadly, so that's disappointing, but I can put numbers on the value of my car. I can't put numbers on the value of my son, but my son is more valuable than all my possessions. So we shouldn't think that the fact that we can't put numbers on some things that we value somehow makes those things less valuable or things that we could reasonably abstract away from. So let's not do that. So what we know now is that we've got this whole list of things that reasons why people value the natural world, value that out there. So again, being completely naive and forgetting about how we actually do conservation, what might we do with such a list? Well, we might go about the process of trying to get all the species and evaluate those species in a kind of Kosiwik way with respect to these characteristics. Uh, naive, okay? So we, people come to us every year and they bring us a bunch of species and this year we're doing the bison and we say, okay, for the bison. How does it match up against this large open-ended list of characteristics that we're interested in? Okay, that is naive. It's crazy. Obviously, we can't do that. Uh, the committee would never stop. But more to the point, actually, we wouldn't agree. We wouldn't agree about lots of the cultural stuff. We wouldn't agree about things like beauty. We might not agree about things like scientific importance, but I think that would be a bit easier. You know, so some of the number of things we could be reasonably confident, but there'd be lots of disagreement around the table. So what do we do instead? We know that there are lots of valuable features of the natural world, but we can't assess them species by, spe by species. We can't really get into personal agreement on them. So we do a cunning trick. We measure a structural characteristic of the system. You know, this is just like for, for anyone who's... Does, it, does Canada go through the hell of research assessment exercises? Uh, New Zealand does, lots of countries do, England, you don't, oh, nice, uh, England does, Australia does, lots of places do, so, so every six years all our research gets assessed, and they need to know how well I'm doing, and you and you and you compare us, and in lots of those exercises, of course it's, it's ridiculous and it's too hard, too hard to have a committee that does that, so instead of doing that you measure a structural feature, you measure citations, how many people talk about what I say? Well, so here, we measure a structural feature. We measure how different species are one from another. And the idea is, so biodiversity here is playing a special role in conservation because it allows us to maximise feature diversity, thereby to conserve the features that we value because we don't know where they're placed. Okay. And if, you know, it's not just about, you know, we wouldn't have time, the committee would have to be too big and people wouldn't, uh, wouldn't agree. Actually, conservation, as we all know, conservation is plagued by uncertainty. You know, it's a difficult job. So, um, lots of species at risk of extinction, uh, particularly due to habitat loss, particularly in developing countries, we just don't know much about. You know, birds 
huge swathes of Indonesia, and we don't really know what we're losing. So we don't know enough about those species. So we've got lots of uncertainty in that sense. But of course, the other thing is that if we're making a reasonable assessment of some of these characteristics, which we think to be important, that assessment's got to be forward-looking. You know, we're doing it for the future and for our kids and their kids and so on and so forth. Um, I'm, I love you know, the L.P. Hartley quote from the, from the go-between, the past is another country. They do things differently there. Well, boy, the future's another country, and we know even less about the future, right? So, so think of all the characteristics I was talking about on the last slide, all the things that we value. How do we evaluate those in 10 generations' time? You know, what are people going to need? What will be useful to them? What will they think is important? What will they think is beautiful? We don't know. Can't tell. So biodiversity special role in conservation is particularly important as it allows us to evaluate conservation strategies in the face of uncertainty about current and future value. So the idea is that diversity allows us to maximise to maximize value in the face of uncertainty, and actually we do this all the time. Colloquially, we call it hedging our bets. Economists call it the maximisation of option value. It's the reason that I have a shed under my house which is just full of crap. It's, you know, I might use that one day and I'm not chucking it out and, you know, it's that thing. It's that thing. So we do it all the time. Um, how do we do it? This would be no good if I was just telling you a story about where I think value lay. Well, we have to ask that question, but it would be much better if I can at least tell you a story about how I think we might go about conservation such that we can conserve value in this sense. And I'm going to try and persuade you that... Uh, what we should do is maximise phylogenetic diversity. That doesn't mean we should spend our days going and measuring phylogenetic diversity. We might use proxies for it. There might be other things we do. We might get it by conserving biodiversity hotspots, so hotspots of species richness or something. But I think that should be the goalpost, and I'm going to try and persuade you of that. Okay, so Anna Moore, of course, the other day taught us all about uh, phylogenetic diversity and uh, so I'm going to give you a much worse version of a very short part of Anna's talk just for anybody who wasn't there. So this is just a, a, a brief characterization of what we mean. So phylogenetic diversity uses the evolutionary history of a group of species, so it's phylogeny, to provide a formal measure of their biodiversity. Um, there are lots of nice surveys around, but I particularly like Veland et al. Uh, from McGowan and McGill's nice new uh, biological diversity frontiers in measurement and assessment. So what it just gives you is a list of different strategies that you can pursue. I like Arna's strategy, I really do, but, but there are others, and I just want to note that there are different things we can mark in phylogeny, because it might come in handy. Later. So, I mean, so on a cladogram on the left, and it's a cladogram because in this case we're just interested in topology, so we're only marking the nodes. So phylogenetic diversity for us is just lots of branching. And you might be interested in that because you just might not have other data. That might be all the data you've got. Um, Distance-based measures. So uh, Anna is over there on the right uh, where uh, branch length is proportional to time. Um, there is a bit of an issue with that because we know rates, of, rates and modes of evolution change over time. So for some purposes, um, people want to try and add in that rates and modes information. And they can do that, especially on sort of limited and local studies, if we're dealing with a relatively small clade, by putting in feature diversity. So Dan Faith has recently done lots of work like this. So, you know, that's the sort of thing you can do. But, but that's the, you know, this is, these are all measures of phylogenetic diversity are not going to uh, pick a winner until later, maybe. Okay. Um, so, uh, now it gets a little bit complicated, but all this stuff is complicated, so we'll just, we just need to pick some things apart here. So, I said right back at the start, so when, when we're doing conservation, we do it for all sorts of reasons, and there's all sorts of science that we have to do it. And so sometimes we, we measure one thing when what we want to do is get at another thing. So, so there are all sorts of projects that we engage at in conservation. What I am trying to persuade you of is the idea that phylogenetic diversity might be a good way of maximising 
option value, but that's not to say that's the only thing we use it for. There are lots of contexts where it's, uncertainty is not king, we're not as uncertain, and um, did I just click the clicker? No, I didn't. Um, yeah, and uh, so we want to conserve something in particular. We know what we're after. We just want to maintain ecosystem function. Uh, so here's a, a quote from Srivastava et al. Phylogeny also determines interactions among species and so help predict how extinctions cascade through ecological networks and thus impact ecosystem functions. We might be interested in the effects of the ecosystem on us, on ecosystem services, and uh, so Faith and others have suggested that actually phylogenetic diversity might be useful in this project too. We argue that an evolutionary perspective is essential for developing a better understanding of the links between biodiversity and human well-being. We outline the services provided by evolutionary processes and propose a new term, evosystem services, to refer to those many connections to humans. So sometimes we're using phylogenetic diversity not in the sense that I'm interested in, the maximizing option value sense, so I just want to sort of mark the fact that we use it for a number of different purposes. Okay, how much do we use it in conservation? Never seen it before. I've, I've never seen this before. So this was in Arna Moore's talk. He comes up with the same slide. And uh, that night I opened my slides and I what am I going to say? Woo, it's the same slide. And then I thought, I know it's the same slide. It's the only big project. <laughs> it's the only project that does this. There are lots of projects that, that have phylogenetic diversity in them as desiderata. Not using them so much. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so there is a, a, a project that is specifically based on um, endangerment plus phylogenetic diversity. But I think it's fair to say phylogenetic diversity is not something that at the moment we take to be one of the main drivers of conservation endeavor. And there are people who've marked this, so you know, there are, uh, we'll just note a few uh, skeptics. So this from uh, Sahotra Sarkar and others. Phylogenetic diversity has long been incorporated in planning tools, but it has yet uh, not yet had much impact on conservation planning. Applications face limitations of available data on phylogenetic pattern. So they do. Uh, from Winter de Victor and Schweiger, uh, to date there is little evidence that phylogenetic diversity has contributed to nature conservation. So, I acknowledge that relatively little conservation effort is presently focused on the conservation of phylogenetic diversity. And that's partly due to the fact that it's, it's hard. It's just harder than species counting uh, or working with hotspots. It's scientifically more difficult. Um, but how difficult it is to measure, how much we do it right now, those are different questions from whether or not it would be a good goal, whether or not it's a thing that we should think of grounding our conservation endeavor. So that's the question that I'm in. OK, um, so now I just want to acknowledge that um, Something like biodiversity, in the sense that I'm interested in, uh, has come up in uh, the writing of others, in particular Sahotra uh, Sarkar and others, raise a similar issue. It's not quite the same thing, but I think it's worth talking about. Um, so, they're interested in surrogacy, and it's just important to mention surrogacy in any talk like this, because often in conservation, we're looking at surrogates. We're measuring one thing when what we want to get at is something else. And one of the, th the things that worries people who are kind of skeptics about biodiversity is precisely that every study looks like a surrogacy study. You know, we're, we're measuring species diversity and, and saying that, that we're doing that because that is, is kind of indicative of of biodiversity or we might be polling the representation of higher taxonomic groups like families because that sort of gives you similar data to species counting. We might be doing something else, we might be doing phylogenetic diversity and we're justifying them all because they give us similar results. There's something that all these things are surrogates for. So that's the question that uh, Saka asks. So I'm arguing we should conserve phylogenetic diversity as it's the best way in which we can secure the valuable features of an ecosystem where we're uncertain about where those features lie. Sarkar and others say, surrogates that are supposed to represent total or general biodiversity are sometimes called true surrogates. Usually 
particular species or other taxa are used as true surrogates, however, because general biodiversity is too diffuse a term to be de precisely defined, the choice of a true surrogate set appeals at least implicitly to some convention or consensus about what constitutes the relevant features of biodiversity in a given context. Thus, choosing a true surrogate set amounts to accepting an operational definition of biodiversity. So they're trying to get at this question of, you know, what's underneath and what are these surrogates surrogates for? Um, they think that what's underneath has to be just something that we agree on by convention. I think we can do a bit better than that. I think we can know some things about it. It's not easy, but I think we can know some things about it. They got here first, so I'm going to use their term, which is true surrogate, which actually I don't like much because it's a bit confusing, I think, but I like making up terms even less. So I'm going to use their term. So we're going to keep talking about true surrogates from here on in. But when we're talking about, you know, what are candidates for true surrogate status, we're going to be talking about how do we get at this issue of biodiversity that maximizes option value. What are we looking at? Okay. Um, so I said I think we can know something about a true surrogate set. So this is what I think we can know. So we're looking at the thing that grounds these claims about surrogacy. So we should be on the bottom of the heap. So a true surrogate should be basic in the sense that it shouldn't itself be a surrogate for some further, more basic type of biodiversity, because we want the one at the bottom. A true surrogate shouldn't fall prey to the same problems that we have in characterizing overall biodiversity, and I'll say a little bit more about what those are in a minute. A true surrogate should capture as much diversity at as many levels as possible. So, it, you know, we, we're aiming for this all diversity or levels thing, so it should be ambitious. And as you can tell from the table, I'm going to compare some candidates. I'm going to compare diversity with respect to form and function, species diversity, and phylogenetic diversity. Form and function. Let's start with form and function, and then we can get into these issues about overall diversity. So, so you know, when I said first up, if we asked, you know, if we're going back into naive land and we asked everybody what they love, what they care about, then they're going to be mentioning aspects of form and function, broadly construed. I'm, I'm running those through together just because form sort of does meet function at the level of physiology and it's, it's difficult to, to pull them apart. So, you know, it looks like form and function is basically what people want. In What's Biodiversity, Kim and I argue that characterizations of diversity in form and function are problematic on philosophical grounds. They're also sort of problematic on scientific grounds, but I think they're philosophical on, uh, they're problematic on philosophical grounds. This comes from uh, an old book, uh, Nelson Goodman's Fact, Fiction and Forecast, and a paper called Seven Strictures on Similarity. It must have been written in National Alliteration Week. Um, so Goodman says, similarity only makes sense when we can agree on the parameters that will underpin our judgments about similarity. What does that mean? So I can look at the people in this room and talk about our similarity. And I can look at features like eye colour and say, you know, we've got so many blue eyes and we've got so many brown eyes. Why can I do that? Because we've all got eyes. I can look at all sorts of features of us because we're all pretty similar in lots of ways. And if you're a taxonomist, you think these are characters and I'm talking about character state changes or something like that. If I'm comparing all the hominids, it's going to be a little bit more difficult because we've got less things in common. If I'm comparing all the mammals, it's going to be tougher still because I've got less things in common. To be a little bit more technical, if you're into sort of morphometrics or theoretical morphology, in theoretical morphology what you're trying to do is model biological difference. And you're doing that by placing uh, ways in which things differ as dimensions in an n-dimensional space of high dimensionality. And you're just trying to look for clusters of similarity. Uh, or you're trying to look for ways to model a space such that you can pop the trilobites over there, pop the ammonites over there, that sort of thing. The problem with that is as you start dealing with m things that are more and more difficult, it becomes more and more difficult to work out what the dimensions of difference are. 
hard enough for the mammals, when we get to the insects, incredibly hard, when we get to the plants that we keep not mentioning, unbelievably hard. You know, how, how similar are we all to uh, New Zealand's mountain daisy? It's just sort of, it, it makes no sense. Um, and science knows this because science has met these things in the past. So, so numerical taxonomy, the, the, the taxonomy based, uh, is sometimes known as phonetics, based on clumpings of biological similarity, hits exactly this problem. I mean, the old rubric was you just measure as many features as possible and compare the species with respect to many features. And that works okay if the organisms are very similar. It doesn't work very well if they're not. Theoretical morphology. Similarly, it's it's a wonderfully cool science. I, I love it. Um, and if you're dealing with you know bivalve molluscan form, it's really cool. You can make a space in which they all sit, and you can see them arranged in the space. Uh, you can, if you read the work of uh, George McGee, for example, the lovely diagrams of uh, ammonites chasing nautiloids around. Sorry, it's the other way around. Nautiloids chasing ammonites around over evolutionary time. And the ammonites eventually go extinct and the nautiloids take up the neighborhood. It's just amazing. It's wonderful. <coughs> Very cool stuff. It doesn't work where you're trying to place things that are radically different in the same space. <coughs> so we can't compare form and function in the sense of just measuring all the traits and mapping them out as some multifactorial problem. It just doesn't work. So, um, on this account, taking functional slash morphological diversity to be a true surrogate would fail on the second condition because it's undefined in the way that what's sometimes called overall biodiversity is undefined. We can't measure it. Uh, what about species diversity? As a true surrogate. Um, so, so first thing, is it, is it fundamental enough? Is it basic enough? And one thing that you might think, so we're, uh, somebody at one point said, hey, why haven't we talked about the species conference in this, uh, the species problem in this conference? And then we didn't. Uh, so so um, we all know that species can be defined in lots of different ways. And uh, if the, you're using the BSC over here and you're using some other version, uh, uh, some other species concept over there, you're not really measuring the same thing unless you have some species concept that's general enough to cover all forms of life. And hey presto, those ones are based on phylogeny. The evolutionary species concept or the phylogenetic species concept, they tend to be underpinned by phylogeny. So you might think that, that um, species difference actually rests on phylogenetic difference. But I think more of an issue is that you might well think, and there are studies that claim, um, that we simply get more feature diversity if we maximise phylogenetic diversity. And I think Anna made, uh, you know, uh, gave us a graphical representation of this the other day. And, and that rests on the process claim that natural selection, you know, the longer natural selection runs and the more lineages that it's working in, the more difference you get. Uh, it's not regular, it's not law-like in that sense, but we might well think on large scale that it works. Um, so yeah, Forrest and others claim we demonstrate the phy that phylogenetic diversity protection is the best strategy for preserving feature diversity. You just get more features this way than measuring species diversity. So if that's right, then conservation of species diversity fails by the third criterion in that it's not sufficiently <coughs> ambitious. Doesn't get us enough difference. Doesn't get us as many features. So what about phylogenetic diversity, uh, my champion? So is it sufficiently fundamental? Um, well, so as I've just said, it does secure us a lot of form and function without us trying to actually you know, measure the form and function independently and compare uh, the features one to another. Does it fall prey to the same problems we have in characterizing overall biodiversity? And that's interesting because now we come back to the different ways in which we can do phylogenetic diversity. And we can do it just looking at nodes. We can do it looking at nodes and branch length if branch length is time. We can do it looking at nodes and branch length where branch length is number of features. And when we start to add in number of features, suddenly we've got to work out which features. And we're comparing features and we've got the incommensurability problem again. So 
Um, yes, I think phylogenetic diversity succeeds by condition two if we do it in a certain way. Um, are there other better true surrogates that might get you all that phylogenetic diversity gets you and more? Um, I'm open to offers, but I think this is uh, the best bet so far. So I think form and function, um, maybe it's okay uh, on condition one. It certainly fails on condition two, fine on condition three. Species diversity perhaps isn't sufficiently fundamental. Perhaps it really does rest on evolution. Um, but in any case, I think it fails on condition three. It's not ambitious enough. It doesn't get us enough difference. Phylogenetic diversity succeeds on one. It succeeds on two. And I think it's our best chance for three. So I think phylogenetic diversity is the way that when we are aiming to maximize option value, so just let's take ourselves back. When we're uncertain, when we don't have some particular agenda or something that we know that we want to say, when we're using biodiversity, I, th I think, you know, in the sense that it's intended in lots of legislation, I think this should be our goal. Thank you very much. We have about 15 minutes for questions before we all head downtown to a respect us Um <laughs> You know, the fewer questions you ask, that, no. It's, <laughs> Anna, go. <laughs> uh, I wonder if you have any um, insight into the role of biodiversity in the development of the Australian Indigenous Peoples Act. Uh, and then um, I mean, you used by many people, actually used. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I think people have to see why it would be a better thing to do than species data. I mean, you know, we just got lots of species data. We do. And what's more, you know, it just looks like species are the things that we ought to be conserving. And that's why we're all here talking about species extinction. So, you know, intuitively, it looks like that's what we ought to be doing. So I think you have to take the extra step and think, you know, it's, it's Ted's issue. It doesn't look right. So you have to take the extra step and work out, you know, why biodiversity is actually useful. And, and I, I just don't think that that's something that we've, that we've done. I think we could do it. And in particular, as you point out, there are other things that are reasonable proxies for phylogenetic diversity. So, you know, we can accept that phylogenetic diversity is the goal and even then think we don't have to go out and get all the data. Um, I mean, you're right, if we're going to compare plants with, you know, mammals, that's, that's going to be hard. That's hard in any case. Did. Do you know they do? Do, do, do you hate it? Uh, I, I actually think that um, both what you said and what Arnett has said about phylogenetic diversity makes it a compelling candidate to consider for the things that we value in nature. And I think the only real difference between the way that I see that and the way that you see it is that I don't think phylogenetic diversity is biodiversity. The way that people like Sarkar are using this term, I don't think he would say this is a, a true surrogate in any sense, precisely because it isn't doing the best to capture total diversity across all levels and so on. And, and the kinds of models that he's developing are being put in place for management decisions, and they're not doing what this would do. And so rather than say, yes, we need biodiversity and let's understand it as phylogenetic diversity, it seems to me that what really needs to be said is, let's talk about phylogenetic diversity instead of this amorphous total biodiversity model that's currently being enshrined in policy. So. I, I like that, Ted. I mean, look, there's, there comes a point, you know, where you get radical ambiguity, where you have to wonder if you should start again, <laughs> if you should just start using a new term and try and persuade people that that's the right thing to go for. So um, I'm certainly open to that. Uh, I agree, Sahotra, you know, wouldn't, it, this wouldn't be his cup of tea. Uh, he, he's much more in line with, you know, these are the, these are the characteristics, here are the checkboxes. Yeah, yeah, I think we're on the same page. Um, 
just a digress for a second. Thank you for that talk. I found it really philosophical in many ways. And um, I've been reading, even in our, within our own species, within our own just human species, we have enough trouble as it is right now distinguishing just within our own species. So that's why I chuckled a bit when you said, you know, all these plants that we don't name. And when I'm reading Said and I and I read his book Orientalism, how we view, you know, the Islam as the other. And you know, we we have no starting point to that. We can't go back and trace where that began and and it's it's like a yeah, like an ambiguous it doesn't go in a circle. It kind of goes I read it in gyres, right? Something that's elaborated on over time and and that's just within our own species. So, you know, and I don't have a strong background in science or biology, but I, I find it really interesting and I found it really philosophical and related to what, what I'm doing right now. So. so, Kim and I always talk about problems like this as units and differences problems. So what you've got is that sort of ambiguity, exactly what you see. And what you're trying to work out is whether there's some framework that allows you to make sense of it, that allows you to see why you get certain similarities and why, even though it's you know, very hard to predict, the whole system might be hard to predict, you know, that allows you to explain some bits of it. Um, and, and, and I think in this case, you know, it's just a matter of trying to work out what the process is that's producing the thing that actually we want to conserve. And the process is natural selection, and so that's the thing we should be tracking. And like one more thing too, like I think it's definitely the, the main issue that you know that there's difference between us and plants and animals. That's that's always going to be there. The difference is always going to be there. Like like in Said, for example, he says that you know the main issue is not that we're all different from each other because it's always going to be there. It's a matter of it's everyday practice and we engage in it unconsciously. And so how are we going to bridge that gap? So you know. Thank you. So I'm a, a practitioner, I guess, of uh, conservation biology. I work for Ontario Parks. And um, I, I, I'm looking at this and I think, well, how would I practically apply this on a scale the size of the province of Ontario or something like that? And um, I'm, I'm having a lot of difficulty with that because we just don't you know. We don't have the information. And I can't see us getting that level of detail across an entire landscape. So that is why we're using surrogates that are much broader and coarser because that's all the information we have. Ultimately, you're protecting spaces, at least in, in my world. You're protecting spaces and you're prioritizing which spaces get protected by some signature that, as I describe it, you say it's Sputnik to observe. And that's, that's, there's a lot of. <clears throat> There, there's a lot of theory that we draw upon to try and pick the best places. But I think with a, and, and a lot of different people have different approaches and they champion their own various processes. Um, I'm an experien hopeless experiential learner when it comes to these kind of things, so I like to try things out on the computer screen and see what sort of results get and get back and where the commonalities are. <coughs> where I think it, a, um, a, uh, a very common thing that unites the various methods that comes up is actually the condition of the landscape. How modified is it? has it been by humans? And the ones that are in the best condition, you can try various ways of using different surrogates and coming up with an answer. But it's the condition of the landscape that often brings it together. So conservation is tremendously complex, obviously. There are lots of people working on different projects. Um, I've been struck by the fact that being in, in, it's lovely being in Canada, and I love the fact that people just say, no, no, we, we don't let species go extinct, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know, we, we have good processes in place. But of course, you know, the rest of the world isn't like that. There, there are lots of places where, you know, we're looking for quick and dirty methods. We're trying to work out where we will put large amounts of aid you know, are we going to send it to Indonesia? Are we going to send it to Brazil? Uh, are we going to... I mean, and there are all the complexities with things like umbrella species and the ecological facts, power species, all this sort of thing. So it's not like we go out there with a shopping cart and we say, right, we've worked out these ones are high and we're just going to save those ones and we'll take those ones away. Um, obviously, it's not that. We've got to, we want to conserve them in situ and we need to get that right. And so actually, often, you know, what 
what people are doing is looking at rarity and they're looking at habitat disturbance. This isn't relevant. And I'm perfectly happy that this isn't relevant. So long as someone somewhere is doing this. I think this is the issue. If, if we're just saying, oh, look, you know, we've got this thing and it's, and it's easy enough to measure and um, I can see around me the local picture. Um, and you can do a good job like that. But, you know, we've got a global situation here. We've got climate change and climate change potentially causing really radical changes to large numbers of ecosystems. And, you know, we would like to ameliorate that. We're not going to do it very well, but we'll, we'll try. So there are going to be big and hard decisions. And maybe some of those decisions are going to be decisions based on how important particular species are. I should, I should say, um, here, I, I'm an interested party because, of course, New Zealand is full of species that, that do well by this uh, measure because we're a very isolated country. That's nothing to do with my thinking at all. <laughs> I like Tuatara. It's just, uh, <laughs> just a coincidence. I, I really didn't want to say anything about it being irrelevant because I was, you know, we introduced this concept yesterday and I was thinking about how would I actually apply that into the framework that we use? And I didn't think it was impossible. I just wondered how I would get there. I just got to give some in mind. So, so one thing we're wondering uh, might work if you have a surrogate of a surrogate of a surrogate. And if you take a barcode, you can take a barcode of anything. You can actually you know, just send it to a transect and just take a barcode of everything you find. You can barcode that up. And it turns out we've done this. It turns out that the barcode tree using the genetic distance based on 315 or 361 base pairs actually gives you, often gives you a pretty good surrogate of the total PD if you actually have the full tree. Because most of the information is actually found in how close, how, how distantly you related are to your closest relative. That's where most of the information comes from, you're trying to maximize it. If you can maximize that, then all the rest is kind of, everyone shares it, so you're going to get stuff down the bottom, so you really got to focus on what's really new in tips. And some really, there's some uh, markers that actually will get that. So I think it could be oper operationalizable with the tech, with DNA technology. If you buy that, it's going to be a surrogate. Of this. Sorry. So uh, whether it's worth it, I don't know. But that's not expensive. Did that on that? I think I think Arnie's Arnie's great. I was just listening to the question about how we did a lot of work on. Uh, Designing optimal protected area networks and so forth, and asking questions like, if we then what we know now would we put parks where they are if the goal was to you know maximizing maximum amount of biodiversity in a minimum amount of area and so forth. And, and I think you know, this idea of, of sort of sam sampling the problems for any re any region, pick a region, for, with environmental DNA schemes would give you the would give you the equivalent of the landscape, you know, of, uh, of, of, of species, of PD richness in the end. And then you can use the same algorithms we use in protected areas of design, subject to minimum size constraints uh, that are ecologically important for, uh, uh, you know, containing the, the, at least the historical range of disturbances and, and, and being resilient in the face of that, th those sorts of things. And then and, and you use those algorithms to kind of lay lay out the protected area network across the landscape I, I, it, with the with the usual representation sorts of algorithms. It's just um, we're just looking for something better than just species richness. It seems to me um, it's that's entirely possible. Even you. Yeah, the only thing I'm going to say is um, one thing that I didn't say that I think we should take seriously is that if phylogenetic diversity is our our sortal, it's our desideratum, then it tells us not just which species we want to conserve, but how much. And that means, you know, when you were saying, and this one, this has got 80 million years, and this one, this has got 200 million years, in some sense, we ought to be spending, you know, more than twice as much energy on that one as this one. And with the, you know, the little, you know, the minnows, the snail darters, well, the answer is virtually zip. I mean, we might have other reasons for conserving them, so that's, that's fine. It's not that we can't conserve them, it's that phylogenetic diversity is going to give us a kind of gradient. And it is going to give us different advice to what we get now, apart from anything else. 
I know I seem to be the insect guy, I'm not an entomologist, but it is going to tell us about insects and arthropods in general. There's biodiversity there that we are not taking account of very much. One last thing about phylogenetic diversity that interests me is uh, this, this is a province that was colonized anywhere between 12,000 years ago and the south to 10, you know, 2,000 years ago in the north. And the species that colonized this project, this, this province, would have come through various pathways. Knowing where those pathways were, I would anticipate seeing higher phylogenetic diversity within species who are still residents of that pathways, because that's where the founders went through. And as you get more distant from the colonization pathways, then you would expect to see less phylogenetic diversity within an in, in individual species group. Uh, so it doesn't mean that we have to go, it doesn't necessarily mean we have the opportunity to go and rejig the protected areas network or that sort of thing in those areas, but it does allow us to think more deeply about the value of the gene pools within those protected areas that happen to coincide with those locations. I agree. Yeah, I think that's correct. Well, what is it? tells you that a more valued area in terms of PD is over there and we went and put a protected area for other reasons. Maybe perfectly legitimate, recreational, cultural, whatever, is over here uh, based on an earlier analysis. I mean, yeah, this, so look, it's, it's, just it's a good, it's a good question. What if phylogenetic diversity doesn't give us the answer we want? What if it tells us we put the national park in the wrong place? And the answer is either we want biodiversity to do some work for us or we don't. It's just an advertising slogan. And I think it can do some work for us. I think it can really do some serious work for us. It, but it's not the only thing that will do work for us. I mean, we, we might have lots of other reasons why the National Park should be there. Um, but if we take this seriously, you don't give us the advice that we have to take. I want to go on record because I always have to that I'm not claiming. Okay, that the parks that do exist are without value unless they're of a certain size and in a certain place that <coughs> satisfy some algorithm. Okay, there's a lot of other people that have accused me of trying to dismantle the protected area system. So, so make that clear that it's not the agenda here. I'm aware, I'm aware that we need beer, but I, I feel, <laughs> I'll leave it up to you as to, to how many questions. We're going to take one final question no. from, from uh, Dr. No. Heisen. Well, we need to wrap it up. Do we have to wrap it up? Can we, can we talk? So would this do away with preserving the polar bear? Since it's not good, they're really just white bears. <laughs> yeah, he says yes. He's the scientist, I'm just a philosopher. <laughs> no, no, I mean, make, it, make it clear. You can only have to choose between the polar bear and something else. People forget that this is about making relevant choices. So it's not as if you, you, you don't... So you can certainly manipulate this depending on what, what framework you choose, right? Of course. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we can continue this discussion at respected frame. So just before everybody runs off, uh, I'll keep this really, really, really brief. Uh, we want to be able to say thank you, uh, thank you to James and to Ursula for, for wrapping up uh, a long day and a long conference. We're fully aware that these days were quite full, but we thought that it was uh, abundance of riches, right? Uh, all of you are leading experts in your respective fields. Uh, to conclude with the question of biodiversity, I think is entirely appropriate because the issue of diversity is applicable to obviously cultural, linguistic and what have you, but also academic disciplines. So to have a diversity of different approaches coming together on this question of extinction and endangered species, I think is, uh, for us at any rate as organizers, uh, it, it, was, it was a complete success for us. It was a great kickoff for our new uh, Center for Evolutionary Ecology and Ethical Conservation. Uh, we hope to do another one uh, maybe five years or ten years <laughs> after, we cover, <laughs> after we recover from this event. Uh, we don't want to keep Santa waiting because of all people uh, he knows who's naughty and nice. So uh, we, gotta, we, we need to take off. But just as a thank you, I obviously uh, I want to thank Albrecht, Jillian, and Jackie, uh, the organizers behind this whole, this whole thing, uh, and to bring into the fold, uh, especially so, Tannis Mercer, uh, who is one of the great... Uh, people behind this, and actually as one example of Tannis's greatness, she gave me a, a sheet with all the names of our volunteers, which I promptly lost, <laughs> but 
because of her, her brilliance, we have a Google Docs. So I'll just name you really quite quickly, right? So these are the people that have been driving you, uh, dealing with registration desks, et cetera, and so on. So they've been fantastic through this whole process. So Taylor, Jessica, Kelsey, Patrick, Sean, Julia, Daryl, Colleen, Michelle, and Ariel, thank you so much. Thank you.